So thank you all for uh, joining for this uh, seminar. Welcome. And um, yeah, so uh, this is the first uh, first uh, migration seminar of December 2021. Uh, we're ending the year with a very special seminar. Um, and uh, we're very lucky to welcome today Dr. Ayman Zohri, uh, who will be sharing with us the key points of his book on migration, culture, and identity, the case, uh, the case of Egypt. Uh, Dr. Zohri is an expert on population and migration studies based in Cairo, Egypt. He's the founding president and president of the Egyptian Society for Migration Studies. Uh, Dr. Zohri is also an adjunct, adjunct uh, professor in the American University in Cairo. Following his early interest in Arab and Egyptian demography, Dr. Zohri's um, research interests have shifted increasingly to the study of migration. Uh, Dr. Zohri is also the chair of the scientific panel on migration union for African population <coughs> studies and former chair of the scientific <coughs> panel on international migration. Uh, the International Union for Scientific Studies of Population from 2011 to 2014. His current research interests include internal migration and urbanization, labor migration, irregular migration, migration and governance, and migration policies in the Middle East and North Africa and Europe. He's, um, he also served as a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Immigrant and Refugee Studies from 2005 to 2013, and currently he serves as a member of the editorial board of the International Migration Review. With this presentation, I'd like to now give the floor to Dr. Ayman. Thank you very much, Soha, and uh, thank you for the organization of uh, this seminar. Very glad to, to be with you today. Um, to talk about my uh, recent book, uh, Migration, Culture, and Identity, the Case of, uh, of Egypt. Um, <clears throat> in fact, um, let me share with you the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation I prepared for uh, this. I believe I can share it. Okay. Um, here is the PowerPoint presentation. Well, so the, my book actually was published in this year, 2021, in Cairo, in Arabic. So the name in Arabic is Al Hijra wa Thaqafa wal Huwiya, Halat Masr, means migration, culture, and identity, the uh, case of Egypt. So, um, why this book? Why uh, I thought of writing a book about uh, migration, culture, and uh, identity. Actually, it is a uh, long story uh, related actually to the fact that Egypt is a migration country, is a, uh, uh, okay, let me enlarge this, uh, is a migration country, is a country made of different streams and different uh, waves of uh, migration. So uh, first of all, for instance, migration uh, and the relation between actually migration, culture, and identity are uh, among the difficult and uh, intertwined topics on which many researchers actually are reluctant to write on them for several reasons. The very most of the uh, important of which of these reasons is that being objective in such research is uh, faced by many difficulties and obstacles. The first obstacle of them actually is uh, the difficulty of separating the researcher himself from the context because we, we are inside the context of the, the, the evolving cultures and the uh, thinking about uh, identity. As an Egyptian researcher myself, who grew up in Egypt and its culture, I may find it very difficult to approach this topic with complete objectivity. No, so that I, I need to confess in the beginning of my presentation. So I'm deeply rooted in this land and my association with it is perhaps one of the crucial things that shaped my culture, my awareness of the world, and uh, also my interpretation of the social phenomena that occur in my country and worldwide. The second and the most important point, if uh, I was able to just past the first point, which is objectivity, is the issue of the uh, positionality within this research and the difficulty of the individual researcher, just one research to complete an integrated work in this topic, simply because no matter what is, what is, what is uh, Kevin, work at the issues of migration, culture and identity are themselves topics that uh, interact or intersect and intertwine with other social sciences. 
I'm demographer, by the way. By training, I'm demographer and geographer. So between migration to Egypt before the 1950s, where Egypt was a little bit closed, and forced migration to Egypt since the beginning of the uh, 21st century from uh, uh, neighboring countries in Africa and in, in Arab region, and the major exodus of Egyptians towards the kingdoms of in the Gulf started in the uh, 1975. Uh, uh, this economic migration to the Arabian uh, Peninsula turned the condition of the Egyptian society upside down with economic boom and social workers abroad to more important than um, money from the Gulf where the non-monetary remittances, I'm here talking about social and cultural remittances brought by uh, returned migrants from the Gulf and their alignment also with the uh, Egypt's political orientation at this time and the status alliance with uh, Saudi Arabia's fundamental uh, Islam against the USSR, uh, former USSR invasion of Afghanistan and had during the period of the late uh, President Sadat, 1970-1981, a period that made for the empowerment of Wahhabi thoughts and the fundamental Islam in Egypt and the rise of supranational uh, uh, affiliations uh, like the, the Khilafa and you know the Islamic nation and uh, such uh, uh, layers, such supranational layers and the national culture and values. An attempt is made or was made in uh, this book uh, to, just to, to uh, trace the story of Egyptian migration, its impact on Egyptian society and the Egyptian identity before and after the, the era of massive migration to the Gulf kingdoms. I follow the story from the beginning from the Napoleon's campaign in Egypt until the present time. Uh, well, uh, so after this short introduction, let me uh, show you exactly. The book is composed of seven chapters. The first chapter is devoted, the, the book is very short, by the way, it is uh, about 120 pages. So the, uh, the first uh, chapter of the book is on the, the inevitability of migration and with, it, it should occur and, and cannot be uh, you know, stopped. Uh, the second thing or the second uh, chapter of the book talks about the question of identity of, history and how we look to our identity as Egyptians. The third is uh, talking about the bombs of uh, Bonaparte, Napoleon uh, Bonaparte and the identity of Egypt and how the campaign in Egypt affected about identity in Egypt and the openness of Egypt to, uh, uh, in Egypt to other countries and other culture, uh, other than the, the Ottoman Empire, I mean. And uh, the fourth uh, uh, chapter is devoted to the family of uh, Muhammad Ali, the, the founder of the century. Uh, and the uh, is affected by the Europeanization tendency of Egypt by Muhammad Ali and uh, his family. The fifth chapter actually is about the 1960s of Nasser and his pan-Arabism and pan-Arab dreams and how they affected the, the identity of Egypt at that time. The uh, chapter number six is devoted to the culture of the petrodollar and the Gulfonization of Egypt versus Europeanization uh, that occurred at the time of Muhammad Ali, the Gulfonization of Egypt, the Egyptian uh, society in recent years or in the last uh, uh, 50 years. And I chapter seven, which is was devoted to the culture and identity mosaic of Egypt. So uh, let me go through the chapters uh, one by one. 
um, to highlight the main or the, the most important uh, issues related to them. The first chapter actually deals with the, uh, the inevitability of migration, that migration is not something bad you need to, to uh, devote work or to avoid. No, migration is uh, good, migration is positive. This is not only uh, my point of view, but I believe that this is uh, part of the reality of the world that through migration, thoughts, religions, and all innovations, and everything good was uh, transferred, um, regardless, of course, of the transfer of pandemics nowadays. So um, it is good. It's, it unites us, even with the spread of the pandemic, the, the world is more united than ever. Uh, so migration and, and the, the approach of migration and to migration should keep the positive narrative about migration as something that unites us as humans, something that benefits humanity through the transfer of knowledge, thoughts, and, 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 and all great things. And Egypt is part of this, and Egypt used to be and still is a melting um, uh, pot of all cultures and all uh, streams of migrations, historic streams of migration to produce the current uh, uh, national identity of Egypt and of us as Egyptians. Um, this, uh, this photo is for uh, a very well-known, uh, respected actress in Egypt, Nelly, of a, an Ar Armenian descent, uh, Egyptian-Armenian uh, actress. Uh, and there are many people like that in the history of Egypt, by the way. Um, the second chapter, I talked about the question of identity in Egypt throughout history. So the question, who, we, who are we? how we regard ourselves. So in fact, because of the multiplicity of layers of uh, cultures and of uh, uh, historical uh, experiences, sometimes we feel confused to whom we uh, belong, actually because of the multiplicity of layers, multiplicity of cultures and norms and traditions, and also the geographical disparity of cultures in Egypt between the urban culture, the rural uh, uh, northern culture, the, the uh, uh, southern uh, uh, rural culture, and the uh, different, uh, you know, the, the coastal uh, governance cultures and so on, many different layers and multicultures. So the multiplicity of cultures sometimes confuses some people when they think about uh, their identity to the extent that we need us to just have to grab just one layer of such rich uh, uh, multicultural uh, society and uh, ourselves to just one layer, which is again the, 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 the development of cultures and the development of societies as well. The third chapter is uh, very debatable, uh, actually, because I started the thinking about identity in the context of this book by the French campaign in Egypt or the Napoleon Bonaparte campaign in Egypt, of course, in 1978 and 1801, just three years that changed the, the, the way of thinking of, I see, I see as an Egyptian, as all Egyptians see that this is a, an occupation and this is something we fought against at that time, but it left something in the in the bad mind of the the way of thinking of egyptians simply because for the uh, napoleon's campaign in uh, egypt we were under the ottoman empire and before at the mamluks and before at the, some people so you know so, uh, so since the 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 uh, napoleon campaign till going back to uh, uh, 332 before Christ, the uh, invasion of the, the uh, Alexander the Grand to Egypt. Since then, until the uh, Napoleon's campaign, we were under uh, foreign powers. 
So these foreign powers were dealt with Egyptians as something to avoid, something different, something should not be considered. So just the people who brought with are the, 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 the people who control Egypt. Uh, though uh, the, the people of Egypt themselves are out of the equation at all. So till Napoleon Bonaparte's arrival in Egypt, the campaign in Egypt, Egyptians were very surprised about what Napoleon Bonaparte brought with him. So um, he was planning to occupy brought with him uh, the, the, uh, the innovations of the West, starting from the, the, the gunpowders, the first time e Egyptians uh, to see something like that, the bumps, something uh, Egyptians, the first time in their history to see something like that, the, where they were fighting the, 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 the uh, army of Napoleon using uh, swords and, and uh, the horses. So, and, and the, the, the uh, French army was fighting them with guns and bombs. So, other than Al-Azhar and the Mamluks and the, the swords and, and, and the, the, the horses, something quite different, something that opens horizons for Egyptians to be modernized, to be open to other thoughts other than the uh, medieval thoughts that uh, continued till the, the Napoleon uh, campaign. Um, again, I, I just want to say that I don't appreciate Napoleon's invasion of my country at all. Um, but as I mentioned, this um, Napoleon went back after three years, but the thoughts that he left about the organization of municipalities, the uh, way even of taxing the people, the uh, hospitals, the way of um, uh, education, new education, other than the introduction of all of these things changed the identity and the mind of Egyptians at that time. And then Muhammad Ali, the founder of modern Egypt, we call in, in the history of Egypt. Um, and when he uh, started ruling Egypt in 1805, the, like four years after uh, Napoleon came from the Ottoman uh, 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 capital in Istanbul, uh, uh, Albanian origin, uh, born in Kavala in uh, uh, Greek. So, so he came from, uh, loaded by European thoughts just to modernize Egypt for the sake of his family, not for the sake of uh, Egypt. Uh, he was an uh, emperor or um, something in between because he um, alliance to the, the, the uh, Ottoman Empire in Istanbul just to continue. But his thought was to uh, just uh, uh, make uh, Egypt as an independent uh, kingdom for himself and for his family, which was happened for about 150 years until the Nasser era. At this time, so starting from Muhammad Ali himself, when he came to a desert country, just uh, uh, the Nile and the desert, uh, he just made for making Egypt the, something like the, the uh, uh, kingdoms of his friends and uh, uh, alliance in, in Europe. So he just wanted to make uh, even the buildings. This photo is in Cairo. So as if it is in, in a European, old European country or, or Rome, because most of the architectures, uh, people and engineers, uh, they come at that time uh, from uh, uh, Italy and France. So just, he just, they just wanted to replicate the uh, views, even the Nile, they just wanted to look like the, their European counter counterparts. So the, to the extent that the first mission to uh, first two missions, uh, Muhammad Ali sent uh, educational missions, Muhammad Ali sent to uh, abroad, I sent just one to, to uh, Italy to learn printing at that time and sent another one to, uh, to France to learn military uh, sciences. Um, and then uh, the, the more, all of them Europeanized the uh, 
the state to the extent that we put off our galabias and um, started to wear the uh, European suits, which is actually the formal dress of Egypt. The, the, the European suit as something to, to uh, to not to be abide to just one cultural dress because the cultural dress is different from different uh, regions. Um, to the extent that when someone asks me, what's your national dress? You know, the, well, actually we don't have national dress because we have many national dresses. So the multiplicity itself made us um, just adopt another uh, uh, cloth or dress of another culture which is sometimes looks uh, strange, but this is actually because of the Eurocentric Egypt that was founded by Muhammad Ali and uh, his uh, family. Um, this is in the uh, fourth uh, chapter. Um, uh, also, uh, I refer here to the importance of the revival of Alexandria. Alexandria was founded by Alexander uh, the Great in, uh, uh, 332 uh, before Christ and actually uh, was uh, revived and was restored by uh, Muhammad Ali, just maybe just to uh, be close to Kavala in uh, Greeks, uh, Greece, where uh, his birth, just to be close to the beach, uh, simply to, to live in uh, um, a place close to his uh, place of birth and place of growing up, maybe something like that. Um, so the um, the capital was in Cairo, but you know in summer uh, the the whole government reside in Alexandria. So and um, they say that the the Egypt was democratic after uh, before 1952 before Nasser. Actually, it was the democracy of of the elites, given the fact that like 70 percent of Egyptians at that time were uh, illiterate. Uh, also, um, the Egyptian nationality itself was not formed in uh, a, a crystal clear way until 1924, the independence from uh, the Ottoman Empire after the foundation of modern Turkey under uh, uh, Kemal, the father of the Turks. So, um, and then, um, as I mentioned, Europe was the model and Egypt at that time was, and, and I believe still in, in public administration, uh, Eurocentric. Um, that's all about chapter four. And then I moved to chapter five about Nasser. So uh, here uh, I'm talking about after 1952, the Nasser's uh, uh, revolution and how the, the, the uh, tendency of just unite the Arab region or just to conquer the Arab region was the idea of Nasser at that time to unite people. This actually was the Arabs at that time were not the traditional or the conventional Arabs of the Arabian Peninsula uh, at that time. At that time, the Arabs of the Arabian Peninsula they, they have had no weight at all on the, in the geopolitics of the uh, region. But the Arabism for Nasser was uh, North Africa and the Levant, um, I mean, uh, the uh, Syria, Iraq, and, uh, and, uh, and the other countries in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Uh, so um, to the extent that um, for the, uh, since the, the ancient Egyptians, since 7,000 years ago, Egypt gave up its name, Egypt, for the unity with Syria. And it was named the United Arab Republic rather than Egypt. And this was for just three years, 1958 and 1961, and then back to Egypt. So see how the Arabism of Nasser made him even uh, just throw out the, the historic name of Egypt for a, a unity with uh, Syria at that time. Uh, then um, art and culture were affected seriously, dramatically with this Arabian uh, uh, tendency of Nasser to the extent that the Egyptian television was called the Arab television and everything became the uh, national, national, the national means regional. They, so uh, regional council for uh, 
population, regional council for so. A regional means Arabian. Until now, we call them uh, in Arabic, al, not al-majlis al-watani, al-majlis al-qawmi for the Arabian, Arabian uh, uh, nationality. Um, so culture flourished in the, in the time of Nasser and the uh, 1960s was the golden age of Arab, uh, of Egyptian uh, culture and Egyptian cultural production like cinema. And actually this attracted many other Arabians to come to Egypt and to affiliate themselves to it. The picture, this picture, this photo is for Fuad Al-Atrash, Syrian. Um, and uh, of the family of uh, uh, Prince Al-Atrash were fighting against the Ottoman uh, occupation. And then they were expelled uh, uh, himself and his family to Egypt and grew up in Egypt and then became a very famous uh, 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 musician and, and, uh, and singer. This is not a, just uh, one single case. There are many other uh, cases in uh, art and drama and also in the uh, production of journalism and theater and uh, different kinds of uh, cultural uh, products in uh, Egypt. So Farid al Atrash, by the way, was offered the, the national, the Egyptian nationality. So he became Syrian uh, and Egyptian, and then he went uh, just to sing in, in uh, Sudan. So they offered him the nationality, and then Lebanon also he has the Egyptian, the national, uh, the nationality of Lebanon. So he was uh, holding four uh, nation, Arab nationalities. And then uh, in this, uh, after Nasser, the Egyptians kept thinking about their identity, uh, especially in uh, 1970s and 1980s with the rise of uh, political Islam and the rise of jihadist uh, Islam to the extent that a uh, well-known uh, scholar, Egyptian scholar called uh, Milad Hanna, Professor uh, Milad Hanna, uh, published a book uh, in uh, 1980s, I believe, uh, it's called the seven pillars of the Egyptian uh, identity. And he counted actually the uh, Greek um, zone or Greek uh, time uh, occupation of Egypt as one uh, pillar, the, and then the Coptic uh, pillar, uh, the Arabic uh, Islamic pillar, and the Mediterranean pillar, uh, seven pillars. Actually, they, um, you know, I believe that they are just layers uh, rather than pillars that the, the culture is based on. They, they um, represent historic pillars. And also, you cannot consider the, the invasion of some people to Egypt as a pillar for uh, their uh, culture, because this was, uh, again, the, the will of Egyptians at that uh, time. Uh, given the fact that Egypt was um, occupied, as I mentioned, starting from 332 before Christ until the 1956, the, which when we uh, gained our uh, independence from uh, from uh, the British uh, colonization, so it is about uh, 2,500 years of uh, occupation uh, of this country. And we're still keeping our identity. So um, this is uh, was I. Uh, uh, these are the the issues I discussed in chapter five, and then in chapter six, which, which is actually the core of my book and the most problematic, debatable, uh, politically sensitive. Uh, chapter because it deals with the uh, current situation. It deals with what happened in the last 50 years in Egypt. It is the culture of the petro dollar and the galvanization of the Egyptian uh, society. Uh, here I'm talking about the influence of the, the uh, migration, Egyptian migration to the uh, Gulf to the Arab Gulf, uh, simply because we have uh, nowadays and in the last uh, 50 years, usually 60% where 60% uh, of Egyptian migrants are uh, expatriate population. They are in the uh, Arab or the Persian, uh, Arab Persian Gulf. 
countries or the uh, dollar, uh, petrodollar countries, as uh, some people uh, call them. One shouldn't undermine the impact of expatriates on the culture of these their receiving states. So here in chapter six, I'm talking about the uh, influence and the impact of uh, the Egyptian migration to the Gulf and the money of the Gulf in invading our culture to the extent that if Muhammad Ali Europeanized Egypt and made it like Europe, the, what happened in the last 50 years made for Gulfanization Egypt and making it looks in culturally very closed and uh, uh, looks the same as the Gulf countries, especially Saudi Arabia. So after the end of the I'm not sure if everyone lost connection, but I did lose the connection of, of Dr. Ayman. Me too, I lost the connection. Okay, let's give him a few minutes. Um, maybe it's just his Wi-Fi. Apologies for the inconvenience, everyone. I'm sorry, we have a bad weather today in Egypt. Yeah, I see, I see the wind, it's crazy, huh? I hope yeah. everyone in Cairo is safe. I see he left the, the call and he's come. Yeah, of course, with this kind of weather, uh, it's so hard to maintain internet uh, stability. We hope that he'll be back soon. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. You're back. Okay, great. Huh. You're on mute. Sorry. Um, can I think you this has nothing to do with the cultural invasion, huh? <laughs> 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 right on time. Okay. So, uh, okay. So the the uh, the topic that I'm talking about is the invasion of the minds of the Egyptians. Uh, so because of the Islamic orientation of these countries made for dissemination this of this jihadi um, uh, thoughts, since the invasion of uh, uh, Afghanistan by the Soviet Union and the rise of Al Qaeda and the jihadists, still the support of ISIS soldiers in uh, Syria after the Syrian Arab Spring uh, started in March uh, 2011. So this chapter focuses on the case of Gulf states and Egypt. It explores the cultural influence of migration on Egypt. These countries actually attempt to diffuse their culture to gain more political, uh, geopolitical power and still doing so through many tools. First, the fusion of Wahhabism that they, they are not only supporting the jihadi Islam and so, but supporting the, um, the strict uh, sect of Islam and imposing the very harsh uh, Islamic uh, practices. And these thoughts were transferred from the, the Arabian Peninsula to Cairo or to Egypt by the, the migrants. Uh, uh, imagine that we have now like 7, 000, uh, 7 million uh, Egyptians in the Gulf and this happened starting from 1975. So there are millions of returnees in Egypt who gave up the uh, Egyptian dress of galabiya made of cotton for the uh, white galabiya made of polyester coming from Saudi Arabia because they think that white is holy. And 
this also affected the um, the, the status of women in Egypt and looking at them as just uh, something attached to their uh, partners or their husbands. This affected also the way of uh, dealing uh, with uh, females and the status of women in Egypt. This cultural diffusion also affected every many aspects of Egypt. So through migrants, the the influence affected also even the the uh, the uh, uh, way of dealing with the cultural products. People became more too uh, reluctant to uh, see movies, to go to the cinemas, to, uh, to, to the extent that some people say, no, these are things are haram or uh, all of these uh, issues because there were no cinema in, in, in these countries, for instance, uh, until recent. So uh, these um, socio-cultural remittances were very negative and that's impact on the Egyptian population is very negative compared to the renaissance of culture that Egyptians uh, witnessed in the 1960s. This affected, as I mentioned, even the dress code of uh, Egyptians. This affected the galvanization or galvanization of the public sphere which this is not something very negative to find the restaurants in uh, uh, Gulf restaurants in Cairo, but when even the, the Egyptian dialect be replaced with uh, some uh, words from the, the Gulf region, um, this is a, a cultural um, uh, issue that can be, that should be dealt with. So uh, in addition to the galvanization of the public sphere and the, the language of Egyptians, also these countries um, uh, affected by the, the, the wealth and the, the revenues from the oil started to control media started to control media, to control the content of the media. And because of 99% of the media, uh, the content of the media, movies, series, or Egyptians, these uh, the, the, uh, TV channels owned by the uh, conservative people in the Gulf started to censor Egyptian movies just to cut uh, uh, hot uh, scenes and uh, kisses and things that they think that they, they, they shouldn't be uh, there. So, um, and this is affected, this affected also the Egyptian uh, culture dramatically. Also, they, um, they started competing with Egypt by just uh, the wealth. You know, like foundation of uh, contests and festivals w without uh, overvalued prices like the best Arab book in, in the year. And they award, they just give the award to others, not to uh, people from their own. Um, foundation of cultural and scientific publications. Most of those who write in these publications were Iraqis, Syrians, and Egyptians, and other uh, nationalities. Buying the rights to broadcast other countries' media and artistic products to the extent that the, in, in the Egyptian TV, sometimes you cannot see specific movies because they were sold solely to specific uh, media uh, uh, channels uh, owned by the Gulf to control the broadcast of this or to broadcast other things other than Egyptian or Syrian uh, uh, media. Uh, also buying the rights of other countries as I mean, uh, other uh, countries' media, as I mentioned, and now developing own TV networks like BN of the football, with um, you know commentators like uh, uh, Abu Trika and other people. So they just select who to say what to the public. Um, these are just uh, examples of the uh, cultural invasion uh, related to. Uh, to the, the petrodollar and its influence. It is, uh, I'm talking here about social remittances and their influence on the Egyptian culture, which, is, which was very dramatic, very severe, that um, affected the rise of political Islam and the, the brotherhood and all of this, because this all, uh, just one thing, it is political Islam. Um, and then I move to, uh, because I wrote actually about this in English, I just want to draw your attention that this chapter, chapter six in this book the, in Arabic is uh, found in English. 
because it is a modified version of a chapter that I uh, published in this uh, edited book by two uh, uh, colleagues, uh, Jeffrey Kohen and Ibrahim Serkeji. The uh, Handbook of Culture and Migration uh, was published in the beginning of uh, this year. So if you, if you are interested in this specific uh, point, you can go to uh, this book. Uh, lastly, the last chapter, which is the cultural and identity uh, mosaic, I mean of Egypt, of course, al mosaic al thaqafi wal huwiyati. So the cultural and identity mosaic in Egypt, I concluded that Egypt is made of the interaction between different layers of culture, which is good and, and I highly appreciate. Second, we should appreciate Egypt is multiculturalism. We can live together with these arrays and these layers of cultures and practices, which is good. Third, the severe impact of the Gulfanization will reach to an end sooner or later, given the fact that even them, the, the, the Wahhabis, they started now to be open. Uh, lastly, Egypt flourishes when it is open to the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ayman. This was uh, very, very nice to hear. And I've been waiting, as you know, uh, for the seminar for a very long time. I'm not going to talk too much. I'm going to open the floor already for questions, discussion. Uh, you can raise your hand using the uh, reaction button, or you can just also unmute yourself and have an open discussion. Uh, I have a question. So uh, I'm sorry, I can't open my, my camera. So I apologize for that. Um, however, I wanted to point to the last um, uh, point you made. So you think that Gulfanization will end sooner or later. Um, and I wanted to ask how you think so. I understand that you say that, yes, it will. I mean, the Gulf countries are opening up. However, don't you see that for, like the Gulf his hands on the media in Egypt is still very present and increasingly so. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, please. <laughs> well, um, actually, uh, I hope so. So, uh, and I believe that uh, the uh, rise in, in Saudi Arabia uh, will affect also, which I'm saying it was great sorrow that when they gave up the, the uh, Wahhabism, this will help us give up uh, Wahhabism as well. But this is the case. So I believe that um, the openness of the regime in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, in this just only part, uh, the, the culture, and uh, will also encourage uh, Egyptians, especially those who uh, are returnees from the Gulf to change their uh, mind a little bit. I know that, you know, changing culture takes time. It took them 50 uh, years to, to uh, invade our culture. And I believe that sooner or later means, you know, give it just one generation, one more generation, Egypt will be uh, more Egyptian than now. Just to give a small example, yeah. there was, so, uh, sorry, did you want to add something, Hannah? Uh, no, I just wanted to thank him for his input. <laughs> okay. Just to like uh, give a small example, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think recently Saudi Arabia had its very first film festival and uh, a lot of women were there without hijab and uh, they were quite modern about it. Um, so yeah, it gives me also a bit of uh, optimism that uh, this might affect the mentality of those living in Egypt, always uh, looking uh, to Saudi Arabia and countries like Saudi Arabia, that they're like the, the best role model. Okay, let's open the floor for other questions. Any question, any comment? May I participate with the question? Go ahead, Mr. Rilo. Thank you. Dr. Ayman, may you consider the uh, study as a scientific research or a point of view? This is the uh, first question. And the second one, uh, what about let, let me uh, ask, answer the first question because, uh, just to allow you to answer to, to reform maybe the second question. It's a mix and match. <laughs> you know, it's a mix and match. My scientific work is in English, uh, just to be to have a chance to be published uh, uh, scientifically. And this is uh, just uh, a, a book for myself, as if, as if I'm chatting with myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Second question. Okay. <laughs> 
the second one uh, why didn't we uh, consider the uh, what what you called it uh, globalization or uh, like that uh, is a part of the mosaic of the egyptian culture too it is against the, the Egyptian culture. So it is difficult to consider it as part of the mosaic, simply because if it is as part of, uh, of the mosaic, this means that we'll survive with it forever. But it's something strange to Egyptians. And uh, we were invaded uh, enough to the fact that we do not want uh, uh, um, other people to invite us anymore. Uh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, uh... Referring to the book of Dr. Milad Hanna, uh, yeah. we, we speak about different cultures from the Pharaonic, Islamic, Coptic, and other cultures. Uh, I think from my point of view is uh, that uh, the globalization or like that is a part of the Arabian culture, uh, like the Skissians uh, or anything, which we may go uh, to deal with it also. This could be your point of view, but from, from my point of view, I see it invasion, not culture, because they, they, there will not be a surviving culture that supports ISIS. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Glad that you're here. Oh, yes, I see your hand. Go ahead. So thank you, first of all, for enlightening me also a little bit on Egyptian my culture and history, because my prior knowledge was really hardly existent. Um, one thing I found particularly intriguing was the project by NASA to replace this national identity by cultural identity. Also reminded me a little bit of discussions we are having these days in Europe, but like leaving the concept of the national state behind us and replacing it by identifying ourselves more as Europeans. And I was just wondering how this really played out in Egypt. Also in the broader population was more like an elite, an elite project, but pretty much decoupled from what was going on for the biggest part of the population, or did really identities change um, in that in that period? Um, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, the European Union is a uh, supranational uh, in Europe, for instance, but it doesn't eliminate the diversity, even in, in, in any place when the, the, a politician, European politicians go to anywhere, they, there, are, there are two flags behind them, not only one flag. They don't give up the national flag against the EU flag. But in, in my region, the supranational identities need to eradicate the uh, national flags for a union, for Khilafa, for a, a empire, for the revival even of Ottoman Empire. They don't have any problem about that. They don't see it as, as an occupation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Okay, I do not see any questions or anyone unmuting themselves. So with that, we can conclude the, today's uh, migration seminar. Again, Dr. Ayman, thank you very much for making the You're time. You're welcome. For the seminar. Thank you. And uh, it was very lovely to have you, uh, especially ending the year with the seminar. Uh, for thank everyone you. else, we have a seminar next week. Um, and uh, yeah, you can check out uh, all the information about it on the UNU Merit website. Thank you all again uh, for joining and have a wonderful rest of the week. Bye-bye. Bye.